Um, so as you know, micro scale farming, urban farming is becoming a lot more, com more common in Utah. Um, we have a lot of very urban areas where we are trying to pack in some growing and farmers and kind of combine this idea of growing on this very small scale in these areas where we're in between homes or in between apartment buildings, something like that. Um, if we look at the 2017 Utah Agricultural Census, we see a large loss in our farmland. Um, between 2012 to 17, we lost over 160,000 acres in farmland. But we also saw this rapid increase in the number of farms and new urban farmers in Utah. So despite that farm acreage loss, we saw 380 plus new farms um, arise in Utah. So that's good news. That means that even though we're losing farmland, we have people that are interested in agriculture, people like you who are wanting to grow food on a smaller scale. We know that these smaller parcels are much different than the large parcels that we normally deal with. Um, so small, uh, the small parcel systems are different from um, these large parcel systems because we have to do a lot of handwork. We have to use different equipment. And our next speaker, Cody Zeziger, is going to be talking specifically about equipment use for this small acreage situation. So we decided um, a couple of years ago that we needed to know more about urban farming and we needed to know the systems really well. Um, we needed to know how to do this so that we could better aid our growers and we could um, implement some practices that and maybe improve some of these practices so that we could help you guys grow more. So at the USU Botanical Center in Kaysville, Utah, um, I established a demonstration garden and it's called the urban farm demonstration garden. It's only an eighth of an acre. So the idea here is if you had a backyard, a typical quarter acre lot and your backyard is about an eighth of an acre, how could you take that and use that as a production area? So we've incorporated a lot of um, different ideas into this garden. I'm mostly gonna be talking about the vegetable areas today um, but in this one eighth acre, we have about 2000 square feet of vegetables. We have both annual and perennial vegetables that we're growing. We have an area for tree fruit, so a very small orchard, 900 square feet. We have about 150 square feet of cane fruits and berries. So we have raspberries, blackberries, and strawberries, and those are in a raised bed system. We have a vineyard with six different varieties of grapes, and then we have a cut flower area that I will be speaking about tomorrow in the cut flower session. Um, it's about 720 square feet. It's very small. And then we've got areas that are grass walkways for teaching areas so that we can get people in and out and people can see the production systems that are happening in this garden. This is what it looks like. If I pan across it, you can see it's quite small, but we've got a lot of things growing, a lot of variety and different um, crops incorporated. We've got a composting system as well. I'm going to show you um, a view from above. complete with cheesy music. So there you go, that's your entertainment for the day. Um, so when we started to pull this idea together for this garden, um, one of the things uh, that really kind of stuck out in my head was irrigation design. We need to design something that is flexible, that makes it so that we can move our crops around. So I was a small scale grower, like many of you, I grew on two acres, just under two acres for a number of years. And one of the things that made it really difficult for me to crop rotate crop rotate and put in different um, spacing in my crops and in my layout was my irrigation design. It was kind of restrictive. So I wanted something that didn't restrict us. And I also wanted something that was highly efficient and put down um, the water exactly where I needed it so I wasn't wasting our water resources. So we looked at drip irrigation um, and we utilize drip irrigation for the raised beds, for the in-ground vegetable planting, and for the cut flower section of this, of this garden. And it was very, um, it was designed with adjustability in mind. So we're using what's called Netafim. You can see it up here in the top right. It just drips away when we turn it on. Um, the rate that it puts out water is 0.9 gallons per hour. Um, so when I run it, I run it for just about an hour in the sections where I'm running it. Now we attached it to ball valves and you can see that um, in this previous slide, you can see the ball valves on each line of drip irrigation. And that is what is giving us some of this adjustability, this ability to turn things on and off in the garden. And these um, ball valves are spaced every 12 inches. 
Um, it's easily movable. I can lift it up and pull it back so that I can do some tilling um, or I can do some planting, whatever I need to do in the garden. This is very flexible. So once a year I go out, I lift the, the drip irrigation and pull it back behind the fencing around the, the garden and I can cultivate very easily. Now it's not the most inexpensive product. It's about $120 for 500 feet. And we used about two rolls in this, in this garden demonstration area. So, um, you know, it does add up quickly. Um, I'm running it for about an hour, like I said, two to three times a week. It depends on the temperature that um, we're experiencing at the time. And we have a sandy loam soil. So of course your irrigation is gonna depend on the type of soil that you have and temperature and also your type of crop. Um, there are other options for drip available, less expensive options, more expensive options. This is kind of a middle of the road option that has worked extremely well for this situation. So you can see these T-shaped PVC sections that come up out of the ground and you can see those ball valves attached. You can see that I've got some of them turned off. Some of them with no drip irrigation even attached to them. The drip irrigation just screws in. Um, and this makes it really easy for me to crop rotate so I can decide where I want this drip. And it gives me this variation in garden design and planting dates as well. So if I'm only going to be um, having some spring crops in at a certain time of the year or some fall crops, I don't have to turn on my whole irrigation system. I can just turn on um, the ball valves that I want to run. And this also allows for wide rows. So you can see the wide rows here. And we're going to talk a little bit about this and how it helps us to be more efficient in the garden. Um, so when we talk about wide rows, this is where we're going to couple crops together. We're going to kind of plant them tight. Instead of having a walkway or an open area between each row, I'm going to squish everything kind of tight and together. Um, and by removing those walkways, it really helps me to maximize my space. So my rows end up being three to four feet wide, much like a raised bed. And I can work from the sides um, on both sides of the row, I'm not going to really be stepping too much inside in the interior of the row to kind of prevent some compaction, um, but it makes it so that I take out that wasted space in the garden and really maximize that space. And then I couple this with interplanting and succession planting. So I will have um, my garlic coming up in an area and then garlic is harvested usually in July. So I take that out and I'll have a crop that needs extra space right next to that garlic, something like tomatoes or potatoes, something that takes up space as we go through this, uh, through the growing season. And then I can, as I remove that garlic, I'm opening up extra space for this larger crop to grow in. So coupling some of these methods with this wide row planting can be extremely effective. So this again, interplanting, intercropping, this is where we take into account that season length of adjacent crops, like what I just mentioned, like with the garlic. So I'll have that shorter season crop or early season crop coupled with a longer season crop. Um, like I said, garlic next to beans and tomatoes, and this will open up that space as our crops are harvested. We're also utilizing succession planting. Um, this is where we have a spring crop followed by a summer or a fall crop in the same location, not necessarily to the side, but to in the same location, or we'll use multiple sowings of the same crop. So my kids absolutely hated it when I did this as a grower because it meant that they had to eat the same crop multiple times. There wasn't just one harvest. So I would go in and I would plant peas um, and then I would come back three weeks later and I'd plant another set of peas or I do this with radishes and I could get three or four different plantings in and they would have to harvest and they would have to eat it more times than just the one time. It's kind of how to be a sneaky grower slash mom. Um, but this will extend our cropping and really prolong our harvest in the garden as well. So if you're going to market, you're not gonna have just that one harvest, you're gonna have multiple harvests that extend that season for a long time. So with these intensive planting systems, these wide rows and we're spacing things so much tighter in this garden, we run into some benefits and some drawbacks of these types of systems. The benefits are that we can definitely reduce our weeds in the system. So you can see how tight things are spaced. Um, you really do have to watch the spacing very carefully because we don't want to get too close. Um, but the farther away we get, um, it opens up areas of sunlight where we can have weed germination and things like that. So we, um, if we space appropriately, we can really reduce our weeds. It also gives us a higher yield potential. So we are pulling a lot more out of these gardens where we have things spaced so much tighter. 
Now the drawbacks to this, these wide rows and tight spacing and you know, continual cropping in this area will definitely cause some increased nutrient demand in our soil. Um, so we are looking at things like cover cropping and making sure that we're incorporating organic matter annually to really boost our soil health so that we can produce a high yielding, high quality crop. We don't want to be producing a low quality crop. And again, we have to consider that plant comp competition. I know Dr. Drost has done some work with spacing that is way too tight. And as we space things closer together, you know, our peppers or our tomatoes, the size starts to reduce because there's so much competition for nutrient resources in the soil. And like I said, we're really working on management of the soil. So we're utilizing fall cover crops. We're utilizing crop rotation. This is probably one of the most important pieces of this type of system is that we're never planting in that same place over and over again. We're rotating our crops. So maybe we have tomatoes in the same place every four years or every three years and really watching our fertility management as well. So vertical planting is one of the big keys to this garden. Um, you know, we've got this eighth of an acre, only 2000 square feet of it is dedicated to vegetable planting. So space is a premium. And I'm gonna show you the yields that we pulled out of this, out of this garden the last two years. It's actually pretty interesting. Um, so everything that we can take upward, we are taking upward instead of making things trail along the ground or take up more space than necessary. We're really pulling these systems upward. Um, so this helps us to maximize that space and maintain our yields. Um, we looked at some different vertical systems. One of them is the string trellis system, and this I'm absolutely smitten with. I love the string trellises. In fact, I've done them at home. I've done them on my small farm, and I've been really, really impressed with them. Um, we're, we're trellising different crops. We've tried trellising tomatoes, peppers, cucurbits, things like um, cucumbers. One thing that we have learned is that this does require shade, and you can see the shade fabric here um, sitting up behind our crops, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, we've also looked at a different system um, for vertical trellising with a cattle panel. This is really inexpensive. It's easy, um, probably the most easy thing for you to do. Um, you just are going to take these cattle panels, pop them up in the garden. Um, we're going to support them with some T posts and make sure that they're really good and sturdy. You need about three T posts per and it works really, really well. Um, and then we've done some stake trellising. Um, we've done a couple of different types. We've done a, done a single stake on each tomato, and then we've done the Florida weave, which you can see here. And this is what the Florida weave looks like. So you can see we've got T posts. They're spaced between our tomatoes or our crops every few um, tomatoes, every few plants. And then we just take string and we weave back and forth in kind of a zigzag pattern through our crops. And we keep doing this over and over and over again as our tomatoes and our plants grow. And this will help to pull the plants in and upward and help us to um, maximize that space so we can get our rows a little bit tighter because our plants are not quite so bushy. Now, one thing I've noticed with this system with the indeterminate tomatoes, especially the heirlooms, they get extremely large and our stakes kind of struggle to hold up these extremely large plants. So um, you might have to space. I found that every two plants works really well. Um, I've done every three plants, that's kind of okay. I mean, we can run into problems where our stakes start to um, bend under pressure. So I would recommend based on the size of your tomato, um, you know, really thinking about that spacing in your plants. This is that cattle panel trellis again. It's easy, like I said, it's inexpensive. Um, we're running eight foot length cattle panels. They're about, you can find them for about $17 per panel, but I've seen them upwards of $35 per panel. So shop around. Um, you will need three of the five foot T posts. Uh, they run about $5 each. And they're of course reusable. Once you've invested in these, you can use them for a million different uses around your farm. And then we use string or we use zip ties to secure. Things like cucurbits do not need to be tied or secured, but our tomatoes definitely did need to be tied. Um, so you can um, just poke the, you know, the trailing plants like the cucurbits up through and they will, they will work themselves up the trellis without much effort on your end at all. Um, but the great thing about this whole thing is it's reusable. You don't have to put a lot of work and effort into sourcing materials every single year. And the string trellis, again, this is a little more involved, but it works really, really well. So um, we used three 10 foot pieces of half inch conduit. 
And the first year we ran three of these, the second year we ran five in this garden. Um, and I spaced a lot closer the second year. So this is the first year. And we only got six plants per trellis on in the first year. The second year we put 10 plants per trellis. So we had a plant every foot. Um, and it worked really well. It was beautiful. Our tomatoes were gorgeous. Um, so the, the conduit runs about $4.85 a piece. So you're looking at about $15. You do not need the center support. We did that the first year and found that it wasn't necessary. And then you're going to need two 90 degree elbows um, to connect this, one on each end. Now I found that the three quarter inch conduit elbows that um, just bend and curve slightly work really well. They're just they're kind of just perfectly made for this. So you're going to go up a size on the conduit and then you just slide the conduit in. And I have a video that shows you how to put this all together and I'll show you where to find that. Um, we're supporting this with two heavy duty T posts on either end. And then we just zip tie the trellis to the T posts. It works beautifully. And then you're going to need some heavy nylon string and tomato clips. Now tomato clips are optional. You can actually just wind the tomato up through the um, or wind the, the string around the tomato as it grows. And it works really, really well. Um, if you want a little added security, the clips work great and they are reusable as well. So it, it costs us about $56 for a trellis, which is a little pricey, but it is reusable. Uh, so here are the videos. Um, you can go to um, a couple of professors um, and myself started a um, social media um, type of outlet where we can teach uh, through that kind of platform. So you can go to Garden Guys and Gal. We have a YouTube channel, Instagram, and Facebook, and you can find the um, how to make a vegetable trellis video. There's also one on pruning tomatoes because it does require some specialized pruning to get the tomatoes to grow in the, in the way that you want them for this. So um, I can actually put these links in the chat for you as well. Now I talked about shade, our tomatoes in the system, um, even on the cattle panels, they also required some shading. Shading is really important. So what happens when we take vegetables up um, and get them off the ground and we do all this pruning, we're taking away the, the plant tissue that would normally shade the fruit. And we noticed the first year, we didn't shade the first year, and we noticed that we had about 50% crop loss due to sunburn, which is not good. That made this whole system not worth it. So um, if we added shade, we found that we had almost no crop loss due to sunburn. It was incredible what the difference was. So we ran a 30% shade cloth, um, no more than 30%. 30% is adequate. It does the job and it doesn't impede the light um, so much that your tomatoes won't grow and will suffer that way. Um, our rows run east to west, so we put the, the shade cloth on the south side. If your rows were running north to south, I would recommend you putting it on the west side. Um, you can find this from many online suppliers and local nurseries. Um, we picked up the kind with rivets. You can see the rivets and the edges are hemmed so that it's reusable. It is a little more expensive for this, um, but you can just zip tie this right to the trellis and it works really well. If you buy it by the roll, you can get it for about a dollar to a dollar eighty per foot, depending on the length of the roll that you purchase. Oops. And then we're also looking at incorporating season extension into the system. Um, so we've we've looked at um, well, we were donated a high tunnel. And um, it's kind of a rickety little high tunnel, but we've been working on updating it and renewing it so it, it doesn't look quite so terrible right now. Um, but we're looking at utilizing some season extension like high tunnels for um, crops like tomatoes, for the cut flower production that we're also running in this garden. And we can also use this as a shade structure. So I can still vertical trellis in this high tunnel, and then I can use shade and just place it over the high tunnel and get the same effect that I would get with the shade cloth that is um, on the trellises as well. Um, we're also incorporating low tunnels in our cut flower production. That's been a very interesting um, type of study to look at to um, see what a low tunnel can do compared to a high tunnel. And then we're using um, things like cold frames. So this is another way to season extend. I actually just planted lettuce in our cold frame last week. It's doing beautifully, um, taking off really nicely. Um, but we grow greens in the, in the winter and in the late fall. And then I switch that cold frame over to basil and I, I actually keep the frame like the cover on the frame, the glass, and I just prop it up and vent it because it really loves the basil really loves the heat. It does extremely well when we put when we apply some extra heat to it. So we'll get an incredible crop of basil out of our cold frame. So 
Um, here's the harvest data. This is where it starts to get really interesting. So this is just for the vegetable crops that we grew. Um, our values were based on USDA pricing at the moment. So I pulled all of this pricing at the time of harvest. Um, we did have some small fruits incorporated into this, um, but only in 2020. And you've got to remember that our tree fruits and our grapes are not yet in production. So they take a few years to really get going. Um, the difference between 2019 and 2020, I'm going to show you here, is um, pretty surprising. In 2020, we kind of focused on really tightening things up and focusing on, um, we focused on high um, value crops. So really turned our attention to those high value crops. Um, we, we pushed the vertical trellising in 2020 a lot more and we looked at succession planting a little more intensely. So the first year, and you, you guys know, you're urban farmers, the first year is always a little bit hard. You're getting used to the area, you're getting used to the land and the systems that you're gonna run. So the first year we pulled out um, 1,500 pounds of produce valued at about $2,400. And then in 2020, there's a big difference. We pulled out um, a little over 2,000 pounds of vegetables, and we focused intensely on these high value crops. So we really bumped up our value in 2020. So we had over $5,000 worth of value. It was pretty, pretty intense difference there. Um, I, I was surprised to see that big of a difference. So this garden is just, it's making an impact. I kind of wanted to tell you where all the produce from this garden goes. So it's not just research, it also does some good in our community. So it goes to the Bountiful Food Pantry. Um, a lot of it does. And we have a, um, a relationship with the Bountiful Food Pantry where they help us to identify um, insecure populations in Davis County, food insecure populations. And we donate um, a lot of this produce directly to these, these populations. We meet at a location and we donate the produce to them. So we've donated since starting nearly 4,000 pounds of food into our community just from this garden. The cut flowers that come out of this garden are donated to Brightening Blooms. It's a, an organization that takes and arranges the flowers um, that we donate and takes them to assisted living, um, long-term care facilities, memory facilities, that type of thing. And so we've been able to donate. Last year we donated over um, 50 different vases of flowers to to our community that way. And then we've also helped with um, government and some of the initiatives that are being passed in Davis County. So in Davis County, you may not be aware, they're working on a mini green belt initiative um, where if you are under two acres or around two acres, you can, um, you can get the green belt tax deductions. And um, I actually went and presented information from this garden to the, the Council of Governments for Davis County. And we were able to pass an ordinance to help get tax breaks for people farming on small acreages. Um, there are some caveats to it and you have to grow something that can be sold, um, that is edible, but it is, we are working towards helping our local growers, um, you know, be recognized for small scale and to help with some of these tax exemptions as well. So if you have questions, Awesome. Okay, let's start with Suzette. On a small scale growing, what are the rules of thumb uh, in location to prevent cross-pollination of like family vegetables? I have grown yellow zucchini and yellow cucumbers and green squash, none fit to eat due to being planted close together and cross-pollination. So this is a really interesting question. So usually when we have cross-pollination of families, it only affects the seed from those families. So if you're saving seed, that's where it would be affecting your vegetables. But if you are just eating or producing to sell, um, you should not have um, a problem with flavor or taste unless the seed that you're sourcing from was cross-pollinated last year. So um, the rule of thumb, you need to be, oh, it's quite a bit. So there are four families in the cucurbits that, um, don't cross, but it's within those different families um, that you get crossing. So um, you need to be a half mile, a mile. It, there's a lot of, of difference. It depends on bee flight. It depends on wind, all of these different things. So um, if you are wanting to save seeds, you have to be kind of on top of it. You have to go out and you have to hand pollinate as soon as flowers open, and then you have to put a bag over the flowers so that you don't get cross pollination if you're trying to save seeds. Thank you. Um, does drip space 12 inches apart adequately water small seedlings that don't have a huge root structure yet? Right. So that's a good question. So the, 
the actual drip lines are 12 inches apart and then the emitters within the drip are six inches apart, I believe. So every six inches we are putting out water. And if I run that system for a full hour, I cover the entire soil surface. It's pretty interesting to watch. You can see the, you know, the um, water start right where the emitter is and it slowly spreads out and it does put out about a foot in diameter. It will soak the soil around that emitter. So yes. Okay, there'll be some more drip irrigation questions, but just to get some diversity, how do you manage vertical gardens in high wind areas? Oh, that's a really good question. So last year we had a nasty, nasty wind come through um, right around Labor Day and it toppled our trellises. Uh, so I did take down the, um, the shade cloth and did everything that I could to help prevent that wind. But I mean, we had winds of you know, 60, 80 miles an hour. In a regular situation where you're not dealing with like an east wind type situation and you've got that wind coming through, wind breaks are a wonderful addition to add to your garden. You can use an edible wind break, something like elderberries or service berries so that you still have the edible component um, and something to harvest. But definitely look at wind breaks. And if you're in a, in, in a situation where you have high winds often, maybe this isn't the exact system that you wanna run. Um, I noticed that the string trellis systems were much more prone to toppling than the cattle panels. They're a little bit sturdier when it comes to wind. Does square foot gardening really work or are tomatoes, peppers, etc., just too big to plant one ever square foot like it suggests? Okay, yeah, this is a really good question. So this is based on um, square foot gardening, that book that was put out by Mel Bartholomew. And um, he suggests one tomato per square foot. Now, if you're dealing with, like, remember, I talked about that Florida weave and how big the plants get. If you are dealing with a plant that is an heirloom that is indeterminate, like one of those types of tomatoes that we love to eat and often plant, um, then the square foot gardening recommendation is likely not going to work. Now, it can work with pruning. So you can take and you can prune the plants and make them fit but you're going to have to stay on top of it. And that's where those videos come in. And I will put the links to those videos in the chat so that you can prune and learn how to do that. Um, do you run your trellis north to south or east to west? Ours are running east to west. It's the way the garden was situated. So we have to run east to west, but you can run north to south just fine. I haven't had a problem running east to west. In fact, most of the fruit growers um, run north to south because then they get um, east side and west side sunlight evenly on their rows. Um, but if you have to run east to west, I haven't noticed a problem running that way at all. Do you, do you put the shade cloth over the plastic of the high tunnel or do you take the plastic off? You have to take the plastic off. So high tunnel management is a really important topic. So if I did not take the plastic off in that high tunnel, the, the temperatures would skyrocket. They get excessively hot. Um, so we would be looking at temperatures well above like 120 degrees if I didn't take that off. So making sure that you take the plastic off and then put on the shade cloth is an important thing. Okay, one last quick one to squeeze in. What percent of shade cloth would you recommend? 30%. So 30% shade cloth is what we run. I wouldn't go any higher than that. So um, higher than that, you're going to impede some of that photosynthesis and light hitting the, the leaves of the plants.